Our next speaker, many of you already know, Pastor David Dykes. He's the pastor here at Green Acres. Yeah. <laughs> pastor Dykes grew up in South Alabama, where he came to know the Lord as a child and started preaching at age 17. I was just learning how to read at 17. After a number of pastorates in the South, he was called to be senior pastor of Green Acres Baptist Church in East Texas. An avid history buff and amateur Israeli educational tour guide, Dykes has led 26 tours throughout Israel and considers the Holy Land the perfect classroom to teach biblical truths. He has authored 15 books. His latest two are novels based in Jerusalem, centered around the Israeli-Arab conflict. His books include The Cloud Strike Prophecy 2013 and The Jerusalem Protocol 2016. He is married with two grown daughters, so please give a warm East Texas welcome to Pastor David Dykes. It's really great to be with you today. I'm going to just sort of sit over here at this uh, stool and uh, communicate with you a little bit about what's happening on the Temple Mount. Uh, you know, I, I can talk about this because... I first went to Israel in 1974, just after the Yom Kippur War, and I was conducting excavations, archaeological excavations at the Bet Shan site. Uh, so that was when I first fell in love with Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Uh, since then, I've been back many, many times, been up on to the Temple Mount a number of times. I've even been inside the Dome of the Rock to see what's there, and I'm really fascinated by the Temple Mount, what has happened there and what is going to happen there. So we're just going to take off and give you sort of a timeline, talk about the history, the past, the present, uh, and finally talk about what is the future of this location. Much of what I'm going to be saying is going to be on the screens, so you'll be delivered from having to look at me. You can just be looking at the screens mostly. Well, what you see there is a replica of the second temple during the time of Jesus at the Israeli Museum. Museum. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. But first, let's get a feel for what are we talking about when we say the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? Well, this is actually the current old city of Jerusalem. And there to the bottom right, where it says Temple Mount, we're talking an area of about 35 acres. And it is some of the most contested property on the face of the planet. Who owns it? Who has the right to it? Uh, what's going to happen to it? Those are questions that people are talking about all the time. And, and as you can see there, if you look, uh, there dominating the center of the Temple Mount is the Dome of the Rock. You might also notice the Golden Gate there, the Eastern Gate, and how it is uh, aligned there. And we'll be talking a lot about that. The little oval that you see down to the bottom right are the excavations uh, that are taking place at the city of David. And we'll be talking about that. Let's talk now a little bit about the past of this area. We'll be talking today about history, geography, topography, theology, prophecy, eschatology. We're going to be covering a lot of things because the story of the Temple Mount is the story of Jerusalem and in a great extent, it is the story of the tabernacle that existed before there ever was a temple. So the first visit, we believe, to uh, the Temple Mount occurred in the year 2000 B.C. Now, this uh, painting by one of my very favorite Italian artists, Caravaggio, uh, is a picture of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Uh, if you're ever in uh, Florence, Italy, you can see this uh, painting at the Uffizi Gallery there. So you see the action taking place there. Abraham was told in Genesis 22 2 to take his son to Mount Moriah, offer him as a sacrifice. And you see a lot in the small frame of this picture because there you see the angel stopping Abraham's hand with a dagger saying, no, no, it was a test. You passed the test. And, and even pointing his nose in from the right is the ram that's going to become the substitute. Now, Hang on to Mount Moriah, that idea, because that's Temple Mount, but we're going to have to circle back around to it, because now our story turns to the desert, and when God told Moses to uh, 
uh, construct a tabernacle. And he gave him very strict instructions on the pattern that he should follow. Uh, Exodus 25, God said, they they are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among you. Now, the whole point of a temple, a tabernacle, was so that God could meet with them, could, could have an encounter with his creation. And I will dwell with them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. Now, here's what a lot of people really kind of have missed in this whole business talking about the temple. Uh, The original dimensions of this tabernacle are the only dimensions God ever gave for a tabernacle or a temple. And, And I need you to look and see that this is relatively small. There was a tent enclosure around the sides, uh, seven feet tall, and all the way down one side, 150 feet. Okay, just think of a football field. That's halfway down a football field, goal line to 50-yard line, okay? That's just the, the surrounding area, the court of the priest. All right, it was wide, 75 feet wide. Now, inside that enclosure, there was a tent, and in that tent, there were two rooms, These became the holy place, of course, and later the holy of holies. Let's start with the holy of holies. Uh, A lot of people are amazed when they learn that it's only 15 feet long, 15 feet wide, forming a perfect cube uh, there, and that's not a very large space. Well, it didn't have to be large because not a lot of people would ever go in there, only the high priest on Yom Kippur. And then the holy place out there, the other front part of the tent, was only 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. And so the entire tent, including both rooms, was 45 feet long. So keep those dimensions in mind because when we're talking about the first and the second temple, you see these big, huge buildings, but the real inner workings of the temple always followed that, those dimensions. And if you really want to fast forward... Uh, the third temple that the Jews want to build will also follow these same small dimensions for the actual worship space of the temple. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. They begin to wander through the wilderness and uh, because they didn't obey God, believe God at Kadesh Barnea. And so it was about the year 1400 B.C. When the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they cross the Jordan River uh, for the invasion of Canaan. And then they conquered the land, and the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. And then, of course, it was stolen by the Philistines for a while until David finally moved it to Jerusalem. Now, let's go to Jerusalem because the topography of Jerusalem uh, has an important impact on the Temple Mount. I want you to think of Jerusalem really before it was a city and just think about the mountains and the valleys. Jerusalem, the city, is com- comprised of a center mountain called Mount Moriah. There's the one in the center. If you move to the left, you have the western ridge, and then you have Mount Zion. We're all familiar with Mount Zion. You go to the right, and there you have the Mount of Olives. Now, we have three valleys that cut through the city. Uh, between the Mount of Olives and the Mount Moriah, there's the Kidron Valley, through which the brook Kidron ran, the same valley that David stepped over when he was being run out of town by uh, Absalom. The same creek Jesus stepped over the night he went up into the Mount of Olives, which was at the foot of the uh, uh, Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of Mount of Olives. There's a central valley, sometimes called the Tyropenean Valley. Uh, and then there's the Gehinnom Valley, which later became a reference and a comparative to Gehenna, hell. These three valleys come together to form what many uh, rabbis believe is the Hebrew letter Shem, Shem, which is a word, a symbol for God, Shaddai, El Shaddai. And so some people even look at the topography of Jerusalem and they say, hey, God has planted his name in the city. In fact, 1 Kings eleven thirty six 36 says, Jerusalem, the city where I have Put my name. In fact, to make it even a little clearer, here's another picture of the topography with those ravines kind of highlighted and the ironic blessing. Can anybody do like that for a minute? Go ahead and take your hands and do the ironic blessings. Is to represent Shin, 
to represent these three uh, valleys. And uh, I'm sure all of you are sort of thinking about it, but uh, it is true that Leonard Neboy, <laughs> he was a Jew. He is a Jew. And they let him come up with his own sign, and he did that, okay? Whether he was doing shim or not, it sure looks like that. So let's talk a little bit more about, about Jerusalem itself. Uh, in 1004 B.C., David captured the Jebusite city. It's called Jebus at the time. And renamed it the city of David. Now, I want you to look at where the original city of, of, of Jerusalem was, rolling down this hill, often called an Ophel, O-P-E-L or O-P-H-E-L, which just means a hump of land. And they built uh, walls and they built houses on it. And the Bible tells us that David and his men went in through a water shaft to take the city. Okay, just up north of the city of David, there we see once again Mount Moriah. And so that's where the temple is eventually going to be. So here's King David. You know, things are good for him. He's won a lot of battles. Uh, The Bible says that he was living in his palace. The Lord had given him peace from all his enemies around him. Then David said to Nathan the prophet, Hey, look, I am living in a palace made of cedar wood, but the ark of God is in a tent. So David said, You know what? We need to just, we need to build a temple. And of course, you know what happened. God said, Well, David, you know, your hands are bloody. You're a man of blood. So you're not going to build a temple, but I'll, I'll let you design it. I'll let you raise the money for it. But your son Solomon will build it. So first of all, David had to obtain the location. Uh, Up on top of Mount Moriah, there was a threshing floor owned by uh, Aruna. Now, why is the threshing floor on the very peak of the tallest mountain? Because that's where the wind would blow. And, 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 And the threshing floor is they would take wooden pitchforks and take the wheat and they would toss it up in the air and the loose husks would blow away by the wind and the heavier kernels would fall down and be claimed. That's what a threshing floor was, and they're very common uh, in Israel. Of course, you know, when when Aruna, if you look kind of down the hill, you can even see David's palace down there. That's that's the old city of Jerusalem down there. When David came up and said, hey, Aruna, I want to, I'd like to buy your uh, threshing floor. Aruna said, oh, king, anything you want that I have is yours. I'd love to give it to you. But David said, no, no. Very important statement. He said, I will not Offer sacrifices to the Lord for that which cost me nothing. So he insisted, I'm going to pay you for this piece of real estate. And paid him 50 shekels of silver. Now, as far as anybody knows in the entire history of the world, that was the only financial transaction buying that property that has ever taken place. It has never been resold, rebought, re-deeded. That was the only time it was ever purchased. So, all right, let's move ahead just a few years because after David died, about 960, Solomon begins to build a temple for the Lord there on the space that was Aruna's threshing floor. Now, I got to tell you, this was some kind of temple. I mean, it was an amazing, majestic, beautiful temple. 183,600 workers spent an entire seven year period building the magnificent temple and not a sound of a hammer hitting stone was ever heard because all the rocks and all the work was done off site so that there was only a place where the pieces the the wood the metal the stone the limestone was assembled it's pretty pretty valuable uh metals in there because i mean if you look at first chronicles tells us that there were uh, 37 75 tons of gold, 37,759 tons of silver. Okay, so I went online just three days ago to find out what's the current price of gold and silver and just did the math, and guess what? In today's dollars, do you know what Solomon's temple would be worth? 157, that's, this is a T, trillion dollars in today's dollars. You say, wow, that's almost as much as the U.S. national debt. (laughs) No, it's a lot more because the U.S. debt is about $19 trillion. Uh, So, wow, can you imagine? This this was the most 
important building of this part of the world at ancient times, and, and people would come to see it. I mean, the Queen of Sheba came to see it. People from travel from all over to see this majestic temple. Now, as you're looking at that temple, you're saying, well, now, okay, I remembered those dimensions that you gave us about the tabernacle, and this, this looks a lot bigger. Well, yes, it is. But all he did was just sort of build ex- additional buildings around that original central shape for the Holy of Holies and the most holy place. So all it is is just building on. This, this is a picture to show you sort of the footprint of Solomon's temple. You got to remember, we're building on the top of a mountain, and it's a mountain that's sloping off. And so they had a smaller footprint for the walls around the temple because of the slope. And those dotted lines that you see, those, those are going to be the boundaries of the size of Herod's temple that we're going to be getting to in a moment, just, just so you can compare it. So, so what happened to this temple in, in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple? Well, you know the Bible story that after Solomon died, uh, you know, Rehoboam said, I'm going to make it tougher on you than my dad did. So 10 of the northern tribes broke off and formed the northern kingdom that is often called Israel. The two southern kingdoms, uh, Judah and Ben, still being called Judah. Uh, 722, the northern kingdom was conquered by Sennacherib and the Assyrians. Uh, and they were totally captured and uh, intermingled and intermarried. And, you know, Sennacherib and the Assyrians attacked uh, Jerusalem. However, we're told in 2 Kings 19.35, that was the night due to the prayers of the people that God sent out one angel. And in one night, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. And so the southern kingdom was spared. So for a total of about 367 years, uh, Solomon's temple flourished and declined according to the spiritual devotion of the kings. And you can read all about this in the Old Testament. Some of the kings were terrible. They were rotten. They worshipped idols. They, they worshipped the Baals. But then you had other kings like Josiah and others that really brought back uh, and, uh, the honor of God's word. And so it, it was kind of up and down until finally, you know, toward the end of the life of this temple, the nation of Israel had become so godless and disobeyed God so much and and worshipped idols that God sent prophets to warn them. You know, hey, if you don't straighten up, if you don't burn your idols, if you don't turn back to the living God, judgment is going to come. And they thought, no, no way. No way. This is the holy city. It cannot fall. This is the holy temple. It cannot fall. But how wrong they were. Because we know without a doubt that in 586 B.C., on the ninth of Av, the month, the ninth day of the month Av, which is called Tisha B'Av, which, by the way, the Jews just uh, observed uh, Monday of this week for the fast of Tisha B'Av. The first temple was destroyed and the treasury was looted. The Ark of the Covenant was never mentioned again in scriptural history. Now, when I say scriptural history, we never find it in the narrative of history. Uh, Jeremiah has some things to say about it that says, like, you know, you, you've forgotten about it, so you don't even need it. In Hebrews, it is mentioned again. And then, of course, in the book of Revelation, it's mentioned again. But we never hear from it again. So uh, that brings up the question. Ark of the Covenant. Where is it? Well, you need to go see the movie, The Adventure of Indiana Jones, you know. Or <laughs> the Lost Ark. And that you have all your questions answered. Tons of theories. My answer to this question is only God knows. Only God knows. Now, the Temple Institute will tell you they know exactly where the Ark of the Covenant is. They say that either Josiah or Solomon, in their wisdom, saw that judgment was coming. And so they very carefully hid the Ark in some deep caves there near the Temple Mount. Others say it's been carried to Ethiopia where it's being held there. There, there's lots of different theories. You can just look it up yourself. But the bottom line is, only God knows. But if you stumble upon it sometime, you know, let us know, because that would be a pretty big, pretty big find. So, you know, 
the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, they, they export some of the finest young men to Babylon for the Babylonian exile. And one of the main guys, and we, we know more about him than the others, is Daniel. And so with no temple, Daniel starts an interesting practice that really is followed to this day by Orthodox Jews. It said when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, meaning the document that you can't pray, he went to his house, the windows in his upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So that's why today, synagogues face Jerusalem. When, when Orthodox Jews pray, they face Jerusalem. Uh, Daniel, as far as we know, is the one that really started that practice, because there was no temple, no synagogue, so let's face the holy city. Well, toward the end of the Babylonian exile, the Persian king Cyrus uh, issued an edict that the Jews could return to, to what was left of Jerusalem to rebuild. And when they returned, uh, they found the city to be in ruins. And you read about this in Ezra and Nehemiah, how they tried to rebuild the walls and finally got around to rebuilding the temple in about 514 B.C. And this is called the second temple. And it says in Ezra 3 that when the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets, and the Levites descended from Asaph holding cymbals, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good, his faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. And, and the rest of that chapter says that some people were so excited they were cheering. And some of the older people who, ha, who, who had heard of the glory of Solomon's temple were weeping. And there was so much noise that you could not tell the difference between the weeping and wailing and those that were cheering. Now, you know, we don't have a lot of depictions of this original second temple. But we do know from some of the writings that it was very plain. Listen, we're talking about a destitute people coming back from exile with no money, nothing to pay for, not like deep pockets like Solomon. And so the second temple was very plain compared to the splendor of Solomon's temple. And over the years, it was renovated whenever they could. But there's always one verse that I've always loved from, from the prophet Haggai. Because Haggai was talking about the first house, Solomon's house, and the second temple, this plain looking thing. And he makes the statement that the glory of the second house will be greater than that of the first. And I always love the fulfillment of that. You know what, you know what made the second temple more glorious? Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God in flesh, walked in that temple. He was there in that temple. So that's what made it more glorious than Solomon's temple. Lots of things happened, you know, after this first uh, temple was built, a uh, second temple was built that maybe you don't even know about, uh, that intersects with history. You all heard of Alexander the Great, this great Greek king, and he's just, you know, going through the whole part of the world, uh, destroying anything he wants to destroy, and he approaches Jerusalem. Now, we know this story because Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about it. He says that for several nights, Alexander had a dream of a man dressed in, in funny-looking clothes with certain colors. And so as he approaches Jerusalem and he approaches the temple, the high priest and some of his other priests walk out to meet him, and it's the guy in his dream. It's the high priest with the one that Josephus says he saw in his dream. And so Alexander the Great is very kind to them and basically says, you know, what can I do for you? And, you know, it's like, well, first of all, don't destroy a city and don't destroy a temple. And they even showed him the writings of Daniel, where Daniel had predicted, you know what? There's going to be a great Greek king who's going to destroy the Persians. And so we do know this, that Alexander the Great left, did not destroy Jerusalem, left the temple intact. Of course, Alexander the Great died. His kingdom was divided among three of his generals. They went really south from there. And really the Syrians were the ones that really 
dealt with what is in Jerusalem. And in the year 170 B.C., something very terrible happened. There was this wicked guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, which is a word he gave himself, which means Antiochus the Great. He uh, looted the temple, he re- renamed it as a temple for Zeus, and even burned copies of the Torah and sacrificed a pig on the temple altar. And some say this was the first abomination that caused desolation because this is such an abomination that all the, all the priests, all the people, they desolated. They left, left the temple. Can you imagine how terrible this must have been for, for really for about 10 years? This awful guy had turned God's temple into a pagan temple. But this is the time of history where the great Maccabean revolt led by Matthias as the godly Jews rebel against uh, outnumbered odds and they, they whip the uh, Syrian army and they reclaim the Jerusalem and the temple and they purify it, rededicate it. And our Jewish friends celebrate this around Christmas time called the Festival of Hanukkah that celebrates this victory. Now, here we are about 160 B.C. I want you to let that be a peg in your mind. This was really about the last time in history for just a short period of time here, maybe a, maybe a hundred years or so during the Maccabeans, because the Syrians were always fighting back and forth. This is the last time that Israel had any kind of self-governing, some, somewhat autonomy. This will be the last time until 1948. So let's see what happened after that, because of course we know the Romans have to come on the picture. 63 BC, they conquered the Holy Land. And then 37 B.C., this guy, Herod the Great, is given the title King of the Jews. And the only great thing about him, because he was a wicked guy too, is that he was a great builder. He built tremendous, tremendous fortresses there on Masada, Jericho, the Herodium. But one of his biggest projects was he said, you know, I want to bring this second temple back up to the glory of Solomon's temple. So here's what he did. 19 B.C., he started a massive renovation of the second temple. Now, what he was, mainly is going to do is enlarge this temple mount area. So he's going to have to basically build a huge retaining wall. So 10,000 slaves brought in hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of rubble and dirt to fill it in and flatten it out. And so this is the, the temple mount as we know it today. He's the one that enlarged it to 35 Acres. This uh, work went on for many, many years, even after Herod the Great was dead. Uh, you, you remember John chapter 2 where Jesus said, destroy this temple and three days I'll build it up. And those Jews said, well, I, this temple's been being worked on for 46 years and you're going to tear it down. So we know even when Jesus was there, they've been working on it 46 years. And we do know that the work continued until 63 A.D., just seven years before it's going to be knocked down. So to give you perspective, if you look at this uh, slide, the blue arrow going down there, that is, that's basically the Western Wall. Uh, that's, that's today where the Jews pray and uh, the holy place for them. So let's take a moment and talk about this second temple in the time of Jesus. Uh, there at the Israeli Museum, there's an amazing scale of the old city of Jerusalem that's based on a... 1 to 50 scale. Again, notice the eastern golden gate in line there with the temple. Uh, There's lots of things you can learn about this as you read your Bible. Because this was not only the temple during the time of Jesus, but also the time of the church in the book of Acts. Uh, You can see those pillars there in the sort of the back wall. That's that's where the money changers and the the ones selling the uh, animals for sacrifice, that's where they would be set up. So it says, when it says Jesus went through the temple, you know, cleansing the temple, running the people out. I mean, he didn't go into the main temple where the priests were. That's those uh, ancillary areas out there on the side. Um, Roman fortress, the fortress Antonio there to the right. Romans built that higher than the temple so they could look down and keep an eye on all the things the Jews were doing. Now, Now notice how large this is, how open it is. 37 acres. Acts chapter 2 says 
that after the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 people that were saved or baptized in one day. And it says they met every day in the temple courts. Now, can you imagine over 3,000 new believers there in the corner outside there uh, hearing preaching, worshiping, praising the Lord? This was the first church where they gathered to worship the Lord. So this has a lot of uh, uh, impact for us when we study the New Testament. Of course, the Roman fortress would have been where Jesus was taken to Pilate, where he would have been tortured uh, by the Roman soldiers. So uh, this is an actual picture, but you know, Jerusalem has always been a subject of art. And uh, this is one called Jerusalem and Oliver Grandeur in about 33 A.D., by Henry Courtney Acellus, uh, just sort of shows the beautiful, uh, calming setting from the Mount of Olives looking back down onto the Temple Mount. Well, you know, the Jews were, they were a pesky bunch, and they kept rebelling against the Romans. They kept fighting against the Romans. They really were terrorists against the Roman armies. I mean, they were, they would use daggers and sneak up behind them and kill them. And so, They were so rebellious that finally it led to a a huge revolt of the city of Jerusalem. And so the Roman general Titus was dispatched to put down the rebellion. And so he lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. And the reason we know so much about this is because Josephus was there. He was an eyewitness to the destruction of of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., Uh, This painting actually hangs in my office here at the church, The Destruction of Jerusalem by David Roberts in 1850. So it was not Titus's intent to burn the temple down. His intent was to capture it and to dedicate it as like a temple to Venus or something like that. But, But the Jews just would not give up without fighting to the very last man. And so fire got spread into the uh, temple area. Uh, they, they, the legions of, of Roman soldiers marched in. And did you notice what day the temple was destroyed? Same day that the first temple was destroyed. Tisha B'Av, ninth of Av. They burned the temple and, ki- and killed tens of thousands of Jews. Now, Josephus had a lot to say about this. And you can just... You can, you can just Google Josephus' destruction of Jerusalem if you want to read how horrific it was. But one thing he said was, you would indeed have thought that the temple was boiling over from its base, being everywhere one mass of flame, yet the stream of blood was more copious than the flames. Folks, this is exactly what Jesus predicted, right? When he wept over Jerusalem... He said they're going to hem you in on every side and they're going to build a trench around you and they're going to attack you and destroy you. In fact, in Matthew 24, he said to his disciples, you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Sometimes people go to Jerusalem today and they stand praying at the Western Wall and they want to say, well... Uh, I thought Jesus said no stone would be left upon another. And here's all these stones that are still stacked up. But that's just the retaining wall. That's all it was. Jesus was talking about the stones of the temple building. And yes, by this time, with Herod's renovation, it had plenty of gold. And can't you imagine the Roman soldiers, after the fire had died, all the melted gold had fallen between the different stones. And so they're prying stones one upon another to get to the gold that was there. But some of them they didn't have to dig for because we also know that before the temple was demolished, the Romans removed all the temple treasuries. There's the candelabra. Very important. So uh, what was in the Holy of Holies of the second temple? Not the Ark of the Covenant. It was long gone. So instead, the only thing there in the Holy of Holies was the big golden candelabra. So that was kind of a substitute for the Ark of the Covenant, which wasn't there. And so, folks, the temple, the second temple destroyed on the same day, the first temple destroyed. But the Jews weren't finished yet. I mean, they had room for one more huge revolt, even though Jerusalem's been destroyed, even though the temple's been totally destroyed. This guy by the name of Bar Kokhba revolted in about 135. And so Hadrian finally said, I've had enough of these pesky Jews. 
put down the rebellion. He sowed salt on a portion of Jerusalem so no one could grow plants there. He totally wanted to remove the name Jerusalem from history, wipe it out. So he renamed the company, uh, the city Aeolia, Aelia Capilatona, and then he dedicated the city to Jupiter. And he renamed that whole region, and this is kind of important, Syria Palestina. And the word Palestina comes from Philistine, Palestine, Philistine, because that was Philistines were in that area. Because there are a lot of people these days claiming they have some kind of Palestinian heritage. No, this was the Philistine, and that Hadrian was the one who named that area. What else does he do? He forbids Christians or Jews to live in the city. So here's what's happening. Um, let's just kind of fast forward a little bit through some of the Temple Mount history and see now how it intersects with Islam because that's going to be kind of the next chapter. Uh, from 70 AD when the temple was destroyed to 330, the Romans are there in charge and the Temple Mount is pretty much ignored. It becomes a refuse heap. But you know what happens in 330? Uh, the Byzantine uh, Christianity becomes legal in the Roman Empire, so especially from the Western Constantinople, uh, the Byzantine Christian period, and there were many churches built there in and around Jerusalem. In fact, there was a beautiful church built on the Temple Mount in 400 AD called the uh, Church of St. Mary's. But here comes the Persians. You know, this is just, uh, uh, they're going to conquer Jerusalem. They destroy churches. They deport Christians. However, there's one church they didn't destroy. They came to the Church of the Holy Nativity in Bethlehem, and they rode their horses in there, and they were ready to destroy the church, burn it down. And then they looked up, and on the wall is a huge mosaic of the wise men who came to bring their gifts to Jesus, and they were dressed as Persians. And they said, oh, these are our guys. We're not going to destroy this church. So that was the only church that the Persians did not destroy. And if you go to that church today, you have to bend to walk into it because after those horses rode in there, the Christians there lowered the height of the door that a horse cannot get into it. You have to bend down to get into the church of the nativity. Okay, well, you know what? Persians were there only for a while because, again, 629 A.D., the Byzantine army... These are Christians. Reclaim the city of Jerusalem. And uh, they built churches back there and everything. And this is a little bit hard to read on, on my screen. I apologize for that. But let me just uh, read to you what's happening there. Uh, about 330 to uh, 614 uh, is the time of that uh, Byzantine Empire. But then uh, Muhammad is born... And in about 620 is when he begins his uh, ministry, uh, hearing from who he calls to be Gabriel. And then he dies in 636 and is buried in Medina. Now, how does that uh, affect us? Because there were some crusades. Um, and in 691, uh, 638, the Byzantine leader Sophronius surrenders Jerusalem to Cal Caliph Omar. Sometimes the Dome of the Rock has been called the Mosque of Omar because he's the one that captured it then. And he cleared the debris from the Temple Mount and allowed the Jews to worship there. Uh, he ordered the building of the Dome of the Rock, but he didn't build it. But Caliph Adib el Malik did build the Dome of the Rock with materials uh, that were from the demolished Church of St. Mary. Uh, what about the El Aska Mosque? It was completed in 702 A.D., and the Temple Mount was renamed in Arabic, Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary. Now, here's the question we've got to ask. Why is the Temple Mount the third most holy site for Islam? What, what right do the uh, Muslims claim to this uh, location? First most holy site, Mecca. Second most holy site, Medina, where Muhammad is buried. So what do they say happened there on the Temple Mount? Well, they talk about the night journey of Muhammad. By the way, it's very rare to find any Islamic art that has pictures because they're so opposed to any kind of uh, idols or icons that all, almost all Islamic art is just patterns. Uh, but there, there are some that uh, still uh, exist. So here's, let me tell you the, the story real quick. Uh, 
One night, Muhammad supposedly was awakened by Gabriel uh, there in uh, Mecca and said, hey, I want you to go for a ride. I'm going to give you this special kind of horse, this burqa, uh, kind of a half horse, half mule, half donkey, but it can fly. So we're going to fly you from Mecca to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, you're going to step on the rock and then you're going to go up to all through the seven levels of heaven till you reach Allah on the seventh heaven. I said, when you hear, hear people talk about the seventh heaven, that comes from Islamic tradition. Uh, in, in our Bible, Paul, there was a man in Christ who was called up to the third heaven, but he went to the seventh heaven. Now, on the way up there, he gets to greet all of the people that are prophets in, in Islam. He sees uh, Abraham. Uh, he sees uh, Isa, Jesus, he even sees John the Baptist. So I didn't know we had a Baptist Muslim there, but yeah, John the Baptist was there. But right up before he gets to see Allah, he, he sees Moses. And Moses is kind of you know, like, almost like chief of staff, it seems like he's up there. And so, so uh, uh, Muhammad goes in and has an audience with Allah. And Allah says, I want you to go back and tell your followers that they, may, they must pray 500 times every day. Okay. He's going back out, and Moses said, well, what did the, what did the boss say? We've we got to pray 500 times a day. You, you can't do that. That's too hard on your followers. Go back and see if you can negotiate that down a little bit. And so he goes back, and all, by the way, all this story and details in my novel, The Jerusalem Protocol, he goes back and comes back. How many now? Well, we're, we're down to about 100 now. Oh, that's too many. So finally, they negotiate to five prayers a day, and so that's how they arrived at that, and so... Uh, Muhammad comes back and today that's why uh, our Muslim friends pray five times a day because of his night journey to uh, heaven. Uh, the, the Dome of the Rock actually is built. They built the rock there where it is believed that Muhammad's steed launched toward the seventh heaven. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. It is not a mosque. It is a shrine. And, and I've been inside there and so don't be surprised that the only thing inside the Dome of a rock is a rock. And there's a little cleft mark in the rock, and they say that's where the hooved steed stepped off into heaven. But there really are some uh, dating, dating problems with the night journey um, that you need to think about carefully. First of all, uh, 520 was the day when Muslims claimed that he made the night journey from Jerusalem. Uh, you need to understand that the Quran never one time mentions the city of Jerusalem. It never one time says that Muhammad went to Jerusalem. You say, well, how, how do they believe that? Well, there's one verse there in Surah 17.1. Glory to Allah who did take his servant for a journey by night from the sacred mosque. We know that to be the grand mosque of Mecca to the farthest mosque, al Aqsa. Aqsa. So Muslims claim that the farthest mosque was in Jerusalem, okay? So they say that's how the story took place. That's why that's a holy spot to us. But here's some problems with that, folks. There were no mosques in Jerusalem in 520 A.D. Because that was when it was under Byzantine Christian control. No mosques were there. In fact, the so-called Fatherist Mosque wasn't even built until 80 years after the supposed night visit. They say, well, how do we get this story? Where can I read about it in the Quran, this night journey? You don't. It's not in the Quran. Uh, Joel made reference to this. There's a ton of writings that aren't in the Quran that are almost like commentaries or reports that are called hadith. Hadith. And, and there's just dozens and dozens of them. It is in the hadith of Sahih Muhammad al Bukra, the story of the night journey, which includes the Sadat, the five prayers. So, I mean, if you went to a Muslim friend and say, show me in the Quran where it says you guys are praying five days, five times a day, they say, oh, it's not in the Quran, it's in the Sadat. It's, I mean, it's in the uh, Hadith. That's where it is. So, that's why, by the way, you have some death separation between Sunni and Shia Muslims because Sunnis accept some Hadith, the Shias don't, and vice versa. So, well, when were these Hadith written? Well, the one that tells this... Muhammad al Bukhra comp compiled the hadith of the night journey 300 years after Muhammad died. So, uh, it's my personal belief and my personal theory, and I'll say that, that's all it is, it's a theory, that 
they came up with a story and reverse engineered it just so they could have a reason to have the most holy place of the Jewish people. And then they said, this is why we have a right to this place. Okay? So that was a big part, I think, of, of understanding the timing of all that. Well, that's not the end of the story because, I mean, uh, then you have the chapter of the Crusades where these European Christians conduct a violent campaign to retake Jerusalem. And it was, it was bloody because Jews were murdered, sold, banished from Jerusalem. The, the Dome of the Rock was converted into a temple called Temple Domini, the Temple of Our Lord. al Aqsa Mosque was converted into the Temple for Solomon. So for you know, about a little over 100 years there about, they were in control of Jerusalem until, once again, the Muslims came in and took it from the Crusaders on September 20, 1187. Saladin recaptured Jerusalem and removed the cross from the Dome of the Rock. By the way, there's a really good movie about this. It's called Kingdom of Heaven that came out in 2005. If you want to see this movie, Kingdom of Heaven, it will tell you about uh, how Saladin recaptured it from the Crusaders. As we fast forward a little bit, during the Middle Ages, uh, Jerusalem was ruled by uh, different groups of people, all Muslims, Mongols, and Mamelukes. But then in 19, uh, 15, 17, uh, something changed, and they went through a period of, of uh, 400 years where they were really under the rule of the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and this became really kind of a time of relative peace uh, in the land. Um, and the, one of the reasons for that is that because there was this really uh, progressive thinking uh, caliph named Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, he did some amazing things that you can still see in Jerusalem today. He's the one that built the walls around Jerusalem. For any of you that have been to, to, to Jerusalem and you ride around those walls, he built those walls, uh, but he built them upon the stones from the second temple period. So we believe that's where they were. Uh, he repaired the Dome of the Rock and the mosque that had come into great disrepair. And this is pretty cool. He allowed Jews and Christians in Jerusalem. <laughs> So uh, some people have even labeled him the, uh, the second uh, Solomon. Uh, and by the way, talking about media, if you take Netflix, there's actually a Turkish soap opera called The Magnificent Century that's all about Suleiman the Magnificent. Now, now he was a rock star uh, because uh, if, you, if you go to the Louvre in uh, Paris, there's this huge painting called The Wedding Feast at Cana that Veronese painted. And, and one of the guests out of time is Suleiman the Magnificent. He even paints him in the picture there sitting at the table at the wedding feast. So he was pretty important. But here's something else he did that's pretty important. When he rebuilt, rebuilt the walls, he sealed up the eastern, the golden gate. Because tradition says that's where the Jewish Messiah will enter. So we're moving through time now. Uh, 1800, Jews really start trickling back into the Holy Land, but by 1866, the Jews become a majority in Jerusalem. I mean, don't think that's a lot of people because the population probably was only about 8,000 people in Jerusalem at this time. Because when Mark Twain visited in 1867, he said you could walk around the entire outside of the city in less than an hour, and there were very, very few people in the city. Well, jumping on ahead to, to the 20th century, 1917, at the end of World War I, uh, the British captured Jerusalem from the Turks. They got it. And so during the time of 22 to 48, this was the British mandate. And waves of Jewish immigrants flood the land of Palestine, as it's called. But all was not very smooth because the British tried to decide between the immigrants and the Arabs that were already there. So they resisted many of these Jewish immigrants. And so, for instance, you can see this sign on the ship that says, the Germans destroyed our families. Don't you destroy our hope. So it was a very tense time, and, and British didn't step up and do what they needed to do and say, hey, Israel, Jews, welcome back in. So in 1947, the United Nations proposed a partition plan. Israel said, okay, we'll accept it. Arabs said, we don't accept it. War broke out. And then we all know that in May the 14th, 1948, the British mandate expired, and at that same moment, uh, Israel declares themselves as a state for the first time in, uh, you know, 
thousands of years. And uh, Jerusalem is named the capital city. And the Knesset is built. It's kind of interesting to see that even in 1952, the Temple Mount, which had never been necessarily a greatly visited place. This is 1952. It was in such still disrepair. Then we move to the Six-Day War in 1967. Israel captures Jerusalem and claimed the Temple Mount and the Western Wall. This is the first time the Jews have been back in control of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount in thousands of years. And as the soldiers prayed there, they wept. That's why Gentiles call it the Wailing Wall. It's called the Western Wall. Gentiles call it the Wailing Wall. And just a few days after they captured this wall, 200,000 Jews from all over Israel came and prayed there. And they said it was the largest gathering of Jews in Jerusalem since 70 A.D., the the time that the Romans destroyed it. Of course, today, you know, the Temple Mount looks really nice. And the reason is because in 1993, as part of a peace plan between Jordan and Israel, King Hussein pays to have the dome recovered with gold plates. Uh, The cost was $8.2 million dollars. Uh, he paid for that by selling one of his houses in London. Just here, here we go, do this. Uh, and it was, it was part of that peace treaty that Israel allows Jordan to still maintain religious control over the Temple Mount. Well, so what about the present? Well, here we see right as we're sitting here today, these, uh, uh, this setting of the Dome of the Rock there. It's interesting that on May 17, just a few days ago, uh, UNESCO, which stands for United Nations Education Scientific Cultural Organizations. This is not the full UN. They voted on a resolution calling uh, Israel an occupying power and had no sovereign right to Jerusalem or to the Temple Mount. As an interesting vote, 22 nations voted for it, 10 against nations like UK, US, Germany, major nations. 23 countries intentionally abstained they knew they might get in trouble if they voted for but they weren't going to vote also if they voted against it and three were absent so only 22 of the 58 nations approved this resolution Uh, and prime minister netanyahu i love your response he said the jews have no connection to the temple mount really then i suppose the ark arch of titus is a fairy tale how many of you have ever been to rome let me see your hand all right how many of you have seen, well, we do know that in 70 A.D. they carried out the, the beautiful candelabra, the menorah. And the Arch of Titus was built in 84 A.D., just a few years after this happened, by Domitian, who was the younger brother of Titus. And there engraved inside the Arch of Titus, guess what? There's the scene of the Roman soldiers carrying off when they destroyed the temple. And... You know, pollution has kind of destroyed that uh, engraving a little bit. But uh, in 1871, somebody drew it. You see the candelabra, the menorah. You see the table for the showbread. You see the trumpets. History says that, yes, there was a Jewish temple there, and the Romans destroyed it. What about the future? Well, in Jewish eschatology, it is believed that the Messiah will arrive when the third temple is constructed. And so there are several organizations in Israel who are committed to the rebuilding of the third temple. One of which is the Temple Institute. They have uh, remanufactured all of the implements to the temple, including the solid gold menorah, which cost about $6 million. And it's actually on display in Old Jerusalem. They've, They've rebuilt all of the showbreads of gold there that the temple, that the priests would use in the holy place. They have completely uh, remanufactured the uh, uniform of the high priest, including the Urim and the Thummim and the golden altar there. In fact, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, they are so committed to getting it into the Israeli psyche for a third temple that they have produced a number of pretty amazing television commercials that they broadcast just all over Israel. Just saying, hey, get it in your mind. There's going to be a third temple. And uh, I've I've chosen to just show you one of these commercials that uh, they show on the air there.
about getting this into the Israeli psyche that, hey, the children want this third temple. Well, of course, the big objection is you can't build a third temple because the Dome of the Rock is where the temple was. Well, there are some theories that say that, but then there are others like uh, Asher Kaufman who says that you can build a temple uh, beside the Dome of the Rock because it lines up with the Golden Gate. And so he's uh, had this theory since 1983. Uh, that's kind of the basis of some of the plot of my book, Jerusalem Protocol. Not the only one. There's a guy by the name of Michael Ruark, who's kind of a global diplomat, who's, who's trying to bring about peace treaties in uh, lots of different countries. He also has come up with a plan where you have a Jewish temple beside the Dome of the Rock. Well, what does it mean for us as Christians? As, as we conclude here, as blood-bought followers of Jesus... You know, we don't need animal sacrifices at a third temple, okay? Uh, There's no need for a holy of holies because when Jesus died, the curtain was torn, right? So why why is a temple important to us or is it? Because the truth of the matter is Jesus is our third temple. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. We don't need a temple in Jerusalem. Jesus is our temple because the Bible says in Colossians, for God was pleased to have all this fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. But however, in Christian eschatology, we know that there's going to be the presence of a third temple because it's going to be associated with some of the events of the last times. Jesus said, Matthew 24, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Now, that couldn't have been Antiochus because that happened before Jesus said this. And I always was amazed that he said, let the reader understand, not the listener, meaning that one generation would be reading this. And then in 2 Thessalonians, Paul said, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes And the man of lawlessness, we believe this is the Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he, here it is, sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. So we do believe there will be a third temple built by the Jews for these things that take place. But folks, that's not the end of Temple Mount. I mean, I want to move on ahead further to the future because let me tell you what the future of Temple Mount is all about. King Jesus is the ultimate future for the Temple Mount because one day he is going to return and he is going to rule and he is going to reign from Jerusalem. You know, I love Zechariah. I'm glad that we chose this Zechariah verse on our, on our armbands. It says in Zechariah 12:10. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem. And they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And they will weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. Then in chapter 14, then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley. On that day, the Lord will become king over the whole earth. Jerusalem will be raised up and will remain on its site. People will live there. I love this. And never again will there be a curse of complete destruction. So Jerusalem will dwell in security. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the Temple Mount, I've got great news. Don't despair. The Lord will reign from the Temple Mount and Jerusalem will be secure. Hallelujah. God is in control. Amen.